any discussion of politics requires a an examination of the backdrop against which the game is being played today you and i are fairly conscious of the issues of our times i presume we know that we're faced with questions of the cold war economic growth unemployment the value of our money and so on but i sometimes think the greatest issue of our times is completely overlooked it underlies all these others because it's the issue of man versus the state individual freedom versus society's rights man's been thinking about this since his very earliest days this was a factor in our own constitutional convention in this country and it remains with us till this very day i'm not sure whether you know it or not but not everyone is convinced that man is capable of being free george bernard shaw in the second act of man and superman wrote a rather remarkable line he said liberty means responsibility that's why most men dread it shaw himself was among those people completely convinced that the human of the species lacks the responsibility to be free and perhaps it was because of this that in the year of 1883 he joined with a group of intellectuals in london in a series of meetings that are consequential to our very times the purpose of this series of meetings was to radically change the direction of british society perhaps the radical change was called for because England of those days lived with some very severe social problems. It's a great amount of unemployment. There were mills in which children were at work. Misery abounded. Shaw and his friends, having had some experience with the capitalist system, were convinced that capitalism had failed. They'd become somewhat intrigued by the ideas of a man named Karl Marx who held that the state had to do the planning for all the component members thereof. Now, while this group of intellectuals agreed with Marx on basic economic theory, they had one very serious disagreement with him. And that was over the method of implementation of the idea that we know today as socialism. Marx, you may recall, preached the doctrine of revolution. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. To the group of British intellectuals, the idea of revolution seemed wasteful of human resources. And so these people sought a, a subtler method through which they might implement socialism in England. During the course of one of their meetings, as they discussed this need for a subtle technique, one of their members, and we're not quite sure which one, told the group a story out of ancient history, and perhaps you remember this from your high school studies. The story of the Second Punic War and specifically the challenge to the Roman Empire by the Carthaginians under the leadership of Hannibal. Remember Hannibal? He revolutionized warfare by coming across the Alps with elephants as his chief armament. And now he stood on the very plains north of Rome, threatening the heart of the Roman Empire. Rome was under the control, under the leadership of a man named Maximus Quintus Fabius. And one thing that might be said for Fabius, he was intelligent enough not to fight Hannibal on Hannibal's terms and on Hannibal's battleground. 
he recognized that if he led the Roman legions out onto the plains north of Rome and engaged Hannibal in a frontal attack, he'd probably be defeated. And so Fabius worked out a method of warfare revolutionary for his times. Rejecting the idea of frontal attack, he, he chose instead to fight Hannibal through indirection, gradualism, bits and pieces. And utilizing this method, he gave additional centuries to the Roman Empire. Now, as this group of British intellectuals told themselves this story, they excitedly saw the prospect of applying the Fabian method to their specific problem. And before this evening was over, they had formally organized themselves as the Fabian Society of London and agreed on the Fabian tactic as the method they would use to implement socialism in England. Now this is not quite as simple as it sounds. What they proposed was to bring socialism by evolution rather than revolution. They proposed to go the legislative route. And the moment that you mention legislation, you're talking about control of an organization which can nominate and elect candidates to public office. Such an organization in England and in the United States is called a political party. They took a look at the political structure of Britain of their times and determined that there were two strong parties, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party, neither of which was vulnerable to what Shaw called permeation. But they noticed also a third group, made up for the most part of radicals, malcontents, people who couldn't find a home in either of the two major parties. And it was into this body that they moved, giving it a sense of direction and destiny, a set of precise objectives to be accomplished Motion, peerless leadership. The name of this organization became the Labor Party of England. Now, I won't recount for you the history of the Labor Party and what it's meant to Britain, except to call to your attention that in the year of 1945, the Labor Party, surrounding the nucleus of the Fabian Society, smashed through to a great victory unseating one of the great men of our times in the prime ministership, Winston Churchill, and bringing to the prime ministership Clement Attlee, a member of the Fabian Society from his early youth. Now you may say, well, what does all this have to do with, with us? Uh, we're Americans. We're somewhat removed from these circumstances. Well, therein lies the tale. For in the year of 1893, an American, a Baptist preacher, by the name of Walter Rauschenbusch, en route to a meeting of theologians in Germany, stopped in London and having heard of the Fabian Society, went and met with them. And became so imbued with this philosophy that he returned to the United States to thereafter preach not only the doctrine of the, of the Baptist sect, but in addition to preach the socialist theology his contributions to this country in the theological area, I won't go into. But as a practical contribution, he procreated a considerable family, the eldest son of which was a man named H. Stephen Rauschenbusch, who picked up where his father left off. For in the early days of the 20th century, Steve Rauschenbusch helped to found an organization called the Public Ownership League and explained to us the objective of this organization, saying our long-term objective is the abolition of the profit system. To his Public Ownership League, he attracted a variety of people, some of them notable names in American history, contemporary history, men like Harold Ickes, men like Senator George Norris of Nebraska, men like Jerry Voorhees of the state of California, one-time congressman, now executive director of the Cooperative League of America. A second thread of the transplantation of Fabianism to the United States begins in the year of 1905 when a second American went and visited with the Fabian Society. This one, an ascetic, intense young man, recent graduate of Wesleyan University, named Harry W. Laidler. 
Laidler drank in all the wisdom of the Fabians possible and returned to the United States to work with Clarence Darrow and other people of stature to found an organization called the Intercollegiate Socialist Society. Now, for whatever reason, the Intercollegiate Socialist Society never got off the ground until the year of 1921, when the name of the organization was changed, changed from the Intercollegiate Socialist Society to the League for Industrial Democracy. The literature of the League for Industrial Democracy clearly identifies the organization as the American Fabian Society. Now, you may wonder why I told you this story in the face of my beginning and crystallization of the great issue of our times. The reason is that as the Fabian has developed his ideas in the United States through the League for Industrial Democracy, through its predecessor organization, one very obvious paradox occurs and reoccurs because the Fabian talks constantly about freedom, the word which is most in incidence after freedom is the word control. And I think I need to say a little more about the paradox that is implicit in this. Now, are we capable of being free? What's the problem beyond simply this question of freedom? Well, it seems to me that as we look at this issue, we should consider it less a matter of a deep, dark conspiracy of some sort than we should the result of apathy, ineptness, and the default on our responsibilities as individuals. I go back again to Shaw's quote, liberty means responsibility. That's why most men dread it. Now, perhaps you'd like documentary evidence. Evidence from a great mind on the matter of the erosion of liberty as we transfer responsibilities to the state. A question many people have discussed. And in my judgment, the most important book done on this subject is this, a book by a distinguished professor of political science at Duke University, Calvin Hoover. Mr. Hoover throughout this book examines the society of our time, including our own, including the Soviet Russians. And in chapter 12, he begins on the subject of what does the economic system mean to the individual? He begins chapter 12 by saying that the extension of the power of the state over the individual whether or not it is in the best interest of the society, represents a curtailment of personal liberty has generally been considered a truism. He goes on then to say, it has been primarily the advocates of gradual economic reform and the less doctrinaire advocates of socialism who have defended the position that the extension of the powers of the state over the economy does not limit liberty. And then he says, the cumulative effect of such measures might critically endanger liberty without the electorate ever having deliberately considered, much less voted upon, the desirability of statization of the economy. That's what this course is all about. An opportunity for you to think, perhaps to learn, and to make some judgments over what kind of a society you want. It's entirely likely that some of you rather favor the Fabian idea, are inclined to support some of the legislative measures that constitute this package. To you, I say this. Some of the most dedicated Americans have been Fabian socialists. My own pet, if that's the right word, is a great lady who died not too long ago, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt taught me one thing in very marked terms. 
that if you've got the ideals, you, you must back them up with the courage of your convictions. In my home state of New York in the year of 1958, we saw a remarkable scene. We saw this woman approaching her 75th birthday, pushing doorbells in her election district of New York City. So if your instinct is toward those things, which Mrs. Roosevelt, which other people who are involved in the Fabian movement in the United States are for, then I say you have a responsibility to work as they've worked to make these things real. If on the other hand, your concern is for your children, you want to maintain an opportunity system and a freedom system for them, then I think it's fairly obvious. You've got a job to do. And the job that you must do must be done in the precincts of your community. <laughs>